goal was accomplished as well. So welcome everyone. All right. I'm just gonna end that now. Okay. So today, this session is actually being funded through our funding through the Finding Your Way program. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Finding Your Way, it is part of the Ontario's Action Plan uh, for Seniors. And this program started in 2012 through a partnership with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. And we continue to apply annually for funding to help us create a safe community for people living with dementia in our own regions. The purpose of Finding Your Way is that it does increase the awareness of the risk of going missing for people with dementia to help prevent missing incidents by promoting the creation of a safety plan and of course to support the safe return of people who do go missing. This program is now available in 12 languages as well. This is just one part of the safety plan and all of us in the Alzheimer's Society do have access to this guide, how to help someone who is lost and confused that we would love to share with you if you feel that you would need to get the safety plan started. And it's really about just putting some things in place just in case you ever need them. So it's our privilege today to welcome Dr. Peel. Yes. Um, Dr. Peel is a geriatrician. We are so lucky to have a geriatrician in our area. Um, a geriatrician is an internal medicine specialist for people over the age of 65, and she specializes in diagnosing and treating conditions that affect older persons. Dr. Peel completed her undergraduate degree in kinesiology at University of Waterloo and her medical degree at McMaster University. She completed internal medicine training at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and Geriatric Medicine at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, she cares for patients living in Huron, Perth, Gray, and Bruce counties who have a referral from a doctor or a nurse practitioner. Her office is located in Wingham, Ontario, where she's supported by a fabulous team, including her administrative assistant, Kelly, and a registered practical nurse, Melinda. Dr. Peel works in partnership with the geriatric medicine nurses from St. Joseph's Healthcare in London, um, including Diane Fox, Allison Hillier, Rachel Thompson, and Karen Burroughs. These nurses uh, may complete a home visit prior to consultation with Dr. Peel to gather background information. Dr. Peel also collaborates with nursing staff and social workers at the Alzheimer's Society's and the Behavior Supports Ontario teams and seniors mental health teams in here in Perth and Gray Bruce. Dr. Peel is also a mother, a wife, a doctor, researcher, and advocate for the care of older persons in our rural community. So welcome, Dr. Peel. Thank you, Dad, that, that was quite an introduction. Um, <laughs> let me just see if I can get my slides up here now. So if, um, if people are having any technical difficulties, uh, just please put that in the, in the chat box. And I'm just, I'm having a little technical difficulty. All right. I think I'm, I'm good to go there. So are you guys all seeing my presentation in presenter mode? It's actually still in the notes um, mode, Dr. Peel, or your preparation mode. Try something a little bit different here. And how about now? There we go. That's in the presentation mode. Perfect. Okay. Yes. My only problem is just that my slides are on a different screen. So just bear with me. 
Okay, are you still in presenter mode? Yes, we are. Good, perfect. I can see my slides now too, so I think um, we're good to go. So uh, I just wanna thank everyone who's taken the time uh, to join today. This is a really important topic and I'm so thrilled uh, to be asked to speak with you today. Um, in terms of disclosures, I did receive a stipend from the Finding Your Way program to prepare and deliver this talk today. Um, but I don't have any uh, commercial or financial interest with any drug company or device company that might be mentioned um, in this presentation today. All right. So uh, moving on to the objectives of today's talk. Um, first, I wanted to just cover briefly what is a geriatrician and what role would they play uh, in the care team of an individual with a memory problem? Then I'd like to cover what's the difference between delirium or an acute conf sorry, confusion versus dementia, which is generally more of a gradual change in memory over years. And how can these conditions overlap in the same patient? Then we'll touch sort of briefly on the multi-component treatment strategies for these conditions. We're gonna shift gears then and talk a little bit about driving safety and driving ability. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about a very broad approach to managing responsive behaviors, which are the behavioral and emotional changes that some people experience when they develop dementia and how we might uh, support caregivers who are experiencing these types of challenges. So just briefly, what is a geriatrician? I think uh, Jeanette and Sherry gave you uh, quite a detailed introduction of that, but basically uh, it's an internal medicine specialist who does extra training in caring for older adults. So we would specifically focus on dealing with people that have uh, multiple complex medical conditions and frailty. So the five M's is kind of our uh, public awareness campaign that we would use to describe what a geriatrician does. So the first M is matters most. So we focus our treatment plan to what matters most for the individual with their goals of care. The M is mind. So that might be delirium, uh, de de sorry, dementia, depression. The, M, the next M is mobility. Um, so that's sort of how people function, how they walk, are they having falls and what can we do to remedy that concern? The next M is medication. So that might be prescribing what is necessary and stopping what is no longer necessary. The last is sort of multi-complexity. And we're getting a, an interesting Dr. sound. Uh, Dr. Peel, your, your slides um, on our view are not advancing. We still have your cover slide. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. How about that? Thank you. That, that is working, thank you. Okay, I'm glad we remedied that uh, early. So the last M um, being multi-complexity, which is basically uh, the idea of managing individuals with multiple overlapping conditions. Because oftentimes if you're seeing multiple specialists, trying to treat one condition might uh, damage the other condition. So in terms of how a geriatrician specialist would fit within your other care providers, at the center of care, we would always have uh, the person that has the condition and their caregiver. Then sort of around them would be their primary care doctor, so their family doctor, or a primary care-based memory clinic. There's also their LIN care coordinator who would be providing home care services. Then sort of in the bubble beyond that, we have the Alzheimer's Society social workers of which you've met several today. We have the geriatric medicine nurses from St. Joseph's Healthcare in London, for which there's one for each county. And then we have a Behavior Supports Ontario team, as well as a seniors mental health team um, in Gray Bruce and Huron and Perth as well. And then sort of beyond that is where the specialty care would generally fall. So you have geriatricians, which sort of focus on the medicine side of things. There's geriatric psychiatrists. So they would focus more on the individuals that have significant mental health conditions or significant responsive behaviors. And then there's also care of the elderly doctors who are family doctors who've taken extra training in how to care for older persons. So a case, we have Mrs. Alciety. She's a 75 year old woman uh, who lives alone on a 10 acre property near Blyth, Ontario. 
Uh, she has a son who lives down the road and a daughter who lives in North Bay. She has high blood pressure and diabetes. She takes medication for her conditions. In the last week, her son and daughter have noticed some unusual behavior. She started to appear weak, unwell, and when her son dropped in for coffee this past week, and she seemed muddled around how she was going to pay her cell phone bill that month. Uh, she was in bed when her daughter called the following day and seemed a bit disoriented to what time of day it was. Uh, her son came by again tonight at supper. She was still in her pajamas. She didn't look like she'd eaten much in the last day. She had bruises on her face and leg, but didn't know how she'd got them. And she told some bizarre story about being or seeing a large car accident out front of her home this morning. So what's wrong with this patient? So when we're talking about um, sudden changes in behavior and thinking, most doctors would divide things very broadly into three categories. So the first one would be a delirium, which is sort of an acute or sudden change. The next category would be a dementia, which generally would be a far more gradual change. And the last category would be a depression or some type of mental health condition. So in terms of features that might make a doctor or anyone think that this is more likely to be a delirium, is that sudden change uh, feature. These people also tend to have impaired attention. So they have trouble paying attention to what you're trying to say. They also have disorganized thinking. So they have trouble understanding what you've just said, or they might respond completely inappropriately to the question that you just asked them. They often have altered level of consciousness. So that could mean they're uh, more drowsy or that could mean that they're actually more hyper or hyper alert or agitated than their usual self. The last key feature is that usually this is due to an underlying medical cause. And we'll go through some of those in a minute. And when you detect this condition in your loved one, you would want to seek urgent medical attention. Um, this is kind of a summary slide for you to refer back to in terms of um, how you might identify these conditions in your loved one. Um, this is a delirium sque screening questionnaire that is designed for people that are living with a loved one or an older adult or someone with dementia to help you sort of try to identify the symptoms in your loved one. And if the person scores more than four, it's likely that they have a delirium concurrent to what their problem is. And if they score more than nine on this type of survey, it's very likely that they're suffering from a delirium. If you'd like to review this more, I just put the link there to the Regional Geriatric Program of Ontario a delirium module for caregivers, where you can find this survey and other helpful resources. In terms of what medical causes to think about when we're seeing someone with delirium, Often you'll hear people talk about urinary tract infection. Um, so, you know, when we detect delirium, often people are saying, well, we sent a urinalysis, we're looking for a urinary tract infection. But the thing to remember is that's only one of a very large list of causes of delirium. And also when we look in the literature of what is the most common cause of delirium, it's actually usually a new medication, stopping a medication, so medication withdrawal, or a toxicity from a medication. So medication should be the first, second, and third thing that you think about in terms of causing a delirium. The next thing to think about would be a substance use or withdrawal. So alcohol would be a common one. Um, dehydration or malnutrition. Uh, constipation or retaining urine. So for men who have uh, challenges with enlarged prostate, sometimes their bladder can actually become blocked and they retain large amounts of urine and this can often cause a delirium. The next sort of area to look at is new medical conditions, um, abnormal blood work, infections. Next, we'll look at the vital signs. So is there something abnormal such as low oxygen or low blood pressure? Pain is a common cause of delirium. And the last thing to think about is that when people have a significant dementia, it doesn't take that much to throw them into a delirium. 
So sometimes it can be something as simple as a change in environment, a change in routine, a change in the caregiver who's caring for them at that time. So what should you do if you have detected that your loved one might be suffering with a delirium? The first thing is to seek medical attention. And you know when we say urgent, um, what generally we're referring to something within 24 to 48 hours. It might be with your family doctor if that's accessible, or it might be within the emergency room if it's not accessible. Other things you can do to help are take a look at that person's medication list. Look in their home for over-the-counter pills that they might be taking. Um, look at medication bottles. Have they taken too much of something or too little of something over the last little while? Um, you might want to ask them about their substance use. You might want to look in their fridge and garbage can. Have they been eating and drinking? You're going to ask about bowel and bladder symptoms. You're going to look at that person. Do they look unwell? Does it appear that they are suffering from some type of medical condition? It's always a good idea to check their vital signs if you have that at home. And checking a blood sugar is important as well, especially if they're diabetic. Asking them about pain, seeing if they might be in pain. And then sort of identifying any changes that you might see in their routine recently that you think might have thrown them off. In terms of what is the treatment for delirium, the first thing is we want to try to reverse the underlying medical concern. Um, the second thing is we're going to try to optimize the recovery environment. And so this is a poster, again, from the Regional Geriatric Program of Ontario, which is, uh, is designed for caregivers. And it goes over six important things to consider. So the first is sort of stimulating the mind. So promoting socialization, playing um, music that they might enjoy, doing some cognitive puzzles, um, having conversation, orienting that individual. The second thing is making sure they're physically active. So if they're in a hospital bed and they haven't moved much around lately, we would want them to be moving at least three times a day. Making sure they're getting good sleep. So if it's in a hospital environment, again, where it's loud, it's thinking about, you know, can we close the door? Can we make sure that the lights are, are shut off? What about some earplugs? Things like that. We want to optimize hearing and vision. So making sure that person has their glasses and their hearing aids and their hearing aids have batteries and that they're inserted properly. And lastly is sort of thinking about their nutrition and their hydration. So it's common that people might get undernourished and, and other people don't notice. So just providing fluids regularly, supporting them with their meal times. In terms of what to say when your loved one has delirium, I've just put an example here of some comforting and validating language. So let them let the person know that you're with them, that they're safe. So instead of saying something like, there are no snakes, you're hallucinating, you could say something like, I know you see snakes on the floor and I know that you're scared, but I'm here with you and you're gonna be safe. And that type of approach tends to be a lot more comforting to people. We're gonna shift focus now and talk a little bit more about dementia. So the first question I always get asked is what is normal versus what does it mean to have dementia? So in normal aging, people's vocabulary and uh, general knowledge tends to get better, right? They know more words and they have a much more worldly understanding. But as we age, certainly short-term memory tends to go down. People's processing speed tends to go down, so they're slower than what they were before. And their executive functions seem to be a little bit more impaired. And so that means they might be slower or have more difficulty reasoning through really complex situations. But the key that separates normal aging from something on the dementia spectrum is that in normal aging, people are still able to manage all of their affairs. So they might be slower, they might seek assistance, but they can still understand and manage what's going on in their life and help with sort of directing their care. The other key thing that people 
frequently say to me is, well, my loved one can't have dementia. You know, it's just their short-term memory that's impaired. Their long-term memory is great. And the thing there to remember is that long-term memory is preserved even in dementia until the very moderate to late stages. And so we can't wait for long-term memory to be impaired before we think there's something um, worrisome going on with the person. If you switch over to kind of looking at the second half of the screen, this is a little graph. And what we know is that some people will have that change in short-term memory and they'll stay within the normal aging category where they are able to manage their affairs. But some people will start to progress on an abnormal category. And we think that there's a um, sort of a trajectory of change that people might experience. So many people pass through this stage called mild cognitive impairment. And that's where we're really starting to see poor performance on memory tests, but they're still doing okay with managing their affairs of everyday life. About half of those people will stay the same forever. And another half will progress on to developing dementia. So then in terms of what is dementia, because frequently I get asked, does my loved one have Alzheimer's or do they have dementia? And the thing to remember is dementia is an umbrella term. It means that someone has had a change in behavior or thinking and it's significant enough to affect their functional ability. So maybe they can't manage driving. They can't manage their medications. They can't manage their finances. They can't make meals or they can't manage their personal care. It doesn't have to be all of those, just one of those um, to a significant degree would be enough to diagnose a dementia. Now under the umbrella of dementia, that's where all of the causes that people have heard about would fall. And so the most common one is Alzheimer's disease. And that's where people have an abnormal protein deposited in the brain. And that protein leads to damage uh, in the cells in that surrounding area. But there are other kinds of dementia. So Lewy body disease is a common one. And that's where a different kind of abnormal protein gets deposited in the brain. Those individuals often have hallucinations, Parkinson's symptoms, so they're stiff and slow. They can have um, periods at nighttime where they're really active in their dreams, kicking and punching. Uh, and they often have fluctuations and so that will mean that they fall asleep easily in conversation or they nap frequently through the day. Vascular dementia is another common cause. And that's where people have experienced either one large stroke or multiple strokes. Or some people just get damage to the very small blood vessels in the brain. And that leads to multiple areas of scarring in the brain, which you can imagine is very hard to send signals through. And so those individuals can end up with the dementia as well. In terms of how we would treat dementia, I think there's a misconception from many, you know, they think when they're going to see a dementia specialist that they're going to be learning whether or not they can receive a pill for dementia. And that is part of the treatment for dementia. But the thing to remember is that this isn't a curable illness in most cases or in majority of cases. And so really we're actually looking at a multi-component treatment strategy to try to optimize that person's brain function and keep their cognition good as long as possible. And so it involves optimizing the person's medical conditions and their other medications, doing some care for their caregiver and doing advanced care planning so that they can stay independent in the community as long as possible. There are uh, medicines that we do talk about, which we'll go through. We talk about nutrition, exercise, cognitive training, and the importance of social activity. We'll talk about minimizing substances, optimization of hearing and vision, and just how to make sure people have enough support at home and how to keep that individual safe despite their disability. So medicines was uh, sort of a topic that I was asked to review um, within the context of, of, of this discussion. So I think, you know, the first thing that we want to talk about is 
many of the prescription medications that people might take for a host of other conditions have the possibility of affecting their cognition. And so common categories would be sleeping pills, pain pills, bladder and prostate pills, mood pills, heart medicines, Parkinson's medicines, diabetes medicines, you name it, the list goes on. And so it is important that someone look at those medicines and do a bit of a risk benefit calculation as to whether the person needs them anymore or whether the harm outweighs the benefit. The next thing that we want to make sure we talk about is over the counter medications. So an, although a medicine can be purchased over the counter without a prescription, that doesn't mean that it's safe. Many things that can be purchased over the counter are actually quite harmful to someone's uh, memory abilities. And so common ones would be things like uh, gravel, anything that has the word PM behind it. So Tylenol PM, Advil PM, they often have sedatives in them. Um, cough syrups, the things that people would take for itching or allergies, antihistamines, they can be quite sedating and affect the cognition. Muscle relaxants, so things that people might take for a sore back or a sore shoulder. Um, medicines for diarrhea like loperamide. And sleeping aids that you can purchase over the counter. So basically anything that you can purchase that's not melatonin is worth sort of considering the safety of. We all, I also just mentioned anti-inflammatories. They don't have so much of a cognitive effect, but in older persons, they can cause leg swelling, high blood pressure, kidney damage, stomach bleeding, heart attacks, and they have many other drug interactions. And so it's just something important that you should look at with your doctor or your pharmacist. Moving on to sort of touching on natural health products. I think many people are not comfortable discussing their natural health products with their doctors. In a 2018 survey of Canadians, over 85% of people were taking some form of natural health product. And uh, about half of those people were fairly certain that their natural health product was safe. And I know that 85% of my patients don't tell me that they're taking a natural health product. So, you know, if you would fall in that category, do make sure that you discuss it, discuss it with your physician. In terms of natural health products that are specifically on the market for memory concerns, um, ginkgo biloba is a common one that has been popular in years gone by. It's an extract from the ginkgo leaf and it's proposed to reduce the stress response in the brain and enhance blood flow to the brain. Um, there has been a fairly large scale study of ginkgo biloba where they enrolled 3000 people over the age of 75 and followed them for about six years. There didn't seem to be any change in their memory symptoms or any change in developing dementia. So the conclusion is that we don't really think that ginkgo biloba has any um, uh, benefit, let's say, in preventing that progression of someone's cognitive decline. And it does have some side effects that were noted in the trial. So headache, nausea, stomach upset, diarrhea, dizziness, allergies. Those are some of the big ones that were identified in the trial. Um, vitamin E is another one that you'll hear about. So vitamin E is found in nuts and seeds. And our usual dietary intake that's recommended is around 22 international units a day. It's also been tested in fairly large studies. So there was a study of um, 2,000 people that had mild memory changes. They followed them for three years, and there didn't seem to be any difference in terms of progression to dementia. Um, there's also been a recent study where vitamin E has been shown to be linked to prostate cancer. And vitamin E is problematic in people that are taking any uh, blood thinners or antiplatelet medications because it can have uh, drug interactions and increase the risk of bleeding. Um, so again, it, it's not a medicine that we generally recommend at this time. Um, Prevagen is another common one because there's a lot of American uh, commercials about Pre Prevagen. Um, so it's an extract from jellyfish. And the largest study of Pre Prevagen, uh, they enrolled um, 218 people that had memory concerns. And they tested those people at day eight, 
day 30 and day 90 of taking the Prevagen. And that's a relatively short time, um, you know, as far as clinical trials go. Those patients showed an improvement on their in-house um, memory test batteries that they, that they had uh, used. But the company never went on to do any long-term studies. They didn't publish any information on the side effects of the medication. And they never tested their product with standard memory tests. So things like drawing clocks, uh, connecting the dots, trails type tasks. And so in 2012, the F FDA actually um, filed regulatory sanctions against this company for making false claims and failing to publish um, some of the information about side effects. So again, it's not a medicine that, that we can recommend for people at this time. So I think, you know, the bottom line that, that you should take from this is that whether it's a prescription medicine, a non-prescription over-the-counter medicine or a herbal product, you should discuss it with your doctor or pharmacist just to make sure that it's safe. Um, natural health products can have interactions with any of your medicines and your medicines can have interactions with them. Um, in terms of natural health products that I do generally recommend, I generally would recommend vitamin D for most persons over the age of 65, um, 1,000 to 2,000 international units a day. There are some exclusions, so please check with your healthcare provider. Um, generally, I recommend calcium intake of 1,200 milligrams a day. Um, the caveat there is that we recommend people get that through diet. So three servings of calcium rich products a day, such as dairy products. Um, and so it's not actually recommended to get it through supplements unless you don't take um, calcium through your diet. I would generally recommend vitamin B12 and iron if you are deficient. And then omega-3 fatty acids is another thing that, that comes up from time to time. Um, our studies have not shown a benefit to taking supplementation, but we do think that there is a benefit to getting omega-3 fatty acids through your diet. And so two fish servings per week is recommended. Um, you know, then people say, well, what about the concern with mercury? Um, mercury is more of a problem in predatory or game fish, so fish that eat other fish. And so if you're eating um, something that is not a game fish, you're, you're going to have less of a concern with your mercury intake. Shifting gears a little bit to the medicines that we often prescribe for people with memory problems. Whenever we're looking at evaluating these medicines and trying to determine whether a person would benefit from one of these medicines, we're always sort of doing a risk benefit calculation. So cholinesterase inhibitors is the first class of medicine that's approved for people uh, with dementia. So the, the medicines would be denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. Um, what we know from these studies is they are not a cure for dementia. Their goal is to try to slow the progression of the disease and keep the person well longer. When we look at the studies, about one in 42 people who would take the medicine would see an improvement in their memory test score. And so that might be getting one more point on that memory test than what they did the time before. About one in 12 people will see less decline on their testing. So rather than dropping three points on testing in one year, they might drop one point on testing in that year. When we compare that to the flip side, which is the side effects, one in 12 people get side effects from these medicines. And so that can be um, diarrhea, urinary incontinence, weight loss, nightmares, slow heartbeat, which leads to then passing out and falling down. People can get a runny nose. It can worsen their breathing if they have conditions like asthma or COPD. So again, each individual has to do that risk benefit calculation. We always would have an ECG, which is an electrical tracing of the heart before we would start that medicine. If your heart has conduction problems or if your heart rate is already slow, then these medicines are considered very high risk. Um, in terms of where I would lean towards recommending this medicine, 
might be in people that are very apathetic, which means they're very withdrawn, they are very disengaged. Sometimes this medicine can help their attention and concentration and they become a little bit more engaged. I also tend towards recommending this medicine if someone has Lewy body dementia where they're having hallucinations because this medicine has been shown to be helpful in reducing the hallucinations. Generally, the other class of individuals where I would recommend it would be people with early dementia, people who are living independently and are trying to preserve that, people that have relatively few health conditions, and people that have a long life expectancy. The flip side to that, where I tend to recommend against, might be if a person is taking a medicine for bladder urgency that directly counteracts this medicine, they have to decide whether they want to take this medicine or whether they want to continue to take their bladder medicine, because it doesn't make sense to take those two items together. These medicines can be a bit more stimulating. And so if we have someone that is irritable, um, agitated, aggressive at times, I would lean towards not trying this medicine. And then the other sort of um, guidance that is helpful is if someone is in the very late stage of disease, if they're living in long-term care, if they have many health conditions or a limited life expectancy, they're probably not going to get the same benefit from this medicine. Now, memantine is another medicine that is on the market. It is an NMDA receptor antagonist. So it blocks some substances in the brain and thereby uh, the hope is that there would be less neurotoxicity in the brain and so less damage to the cells in the brain. Um, the biggest thing that comes up related to this medicine is uh, the cost for most patients because it's not covered by Ontario drug benefit and so people would be paying out of pocket. And some people might prefer to spend $100 to $200 a month on something else for their loved one with dementia. So maybe a personal trainer or maybe some type of cognitive stimulation program. Other things to know is this medicine is not used in early dementia. It's been studied and it wasn't shown to produce any benefit. And so it is really only used in moderate to late stage disease. Um, it is often combined with the other medicine, so the, the cholinesterase inhibitor medicine. But when we look at studies, it doesn't seem that taking the two of them together provides any more benefit than taking the one of them individually. This medicine unfortunately does have side effects as well for some people. And the big one that I worry about is people that have cardiac disease. So if a person has heart failure, heart attacks, chest pain, this may not be a good medicine for them because it can increase that risk. You should always talk to your doctor if you're wondering about either of these medicines, because again, it is an individual decision based on your health and your other health conditions. Um, last thing to mention with regard to medication, there are a lot of research trials going on in dementia. So if you are interested in being involved in a study that is testing a new medicine for dementia, I've put the contact information for Sarah Best, who's the research coordinator at St. Joseph's Healthcare in London. I've also put the link to uh, the Toronto Dementia Research Organization below that. And so you can always contact both centers um, if they are both uh, accessible for you and ask about what trials they've got, got going on if you have a particular interest in research. Um, diet is something that we also talk about. So kind of linked to the natural health product uh, discussion. Um, what is generally recommended in people that are struggling with dementia is a Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean style diet is very much in keeping with the Canada's food guide diet, which is what I've shown you here on this slide. And so that's basically the idea that one half your plate should be fruit and vegetables. One quarter of your plate should be uh, lean meat, chicken, protein, eggs, nuts, fish, um, and then one quarter would be whole grain products. 
And so packaged and processed items are generally discouraged in this type of uh, dietary pattern. Um, the last sort of consideration I want to just leave you with in dementia, um, sleep apnea is something that we talk a lot about. So it's very common and that's where people either stop breathing or uh, their breathing is obstructed when they're breathing at nighttime. This can cause fluctuations in oxygen and carbon dioxide. And what we know that is that if we detect and we treat this condition, it can actually help people with their cognitive symptoms. And so going for an overnight oxygen study or a sleep study is something that we'll often recommend. Um, physical exercise is a recommendation. So 150 minutes a day, or sorry, 150 minutes a week of uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity, as well as two resistance training sessions per week. Um, cognitive and social activity is recommended. So I've put some links below here to um, some brochures that are by the Alzheimer Society that go over um, both some memory uh, optimization strategies and some uh, cognitive rehabilitation type of techniques. And then the last piece we talk a lot about, um, or I talk a lot about with my patients is just vascular risk factor optimization. So targets for blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, those can change if a person is diagnosed with dementia. So back to our case again. So uh, Mrs. Alcidi with the symptoms that she was experiencing was diagnosed with a delirium. She went on to have blood work, a urine sample, an ECG tracing of her heart, chest X-ray and a CT scan of her head. She had a bladder scan to look for urine retention, which she did not have. She was found to have some constipation, so she was started on some medicine for that. It was also discovered that she'd been taking gravol for sleep over the last little while. And so um, that medicine was stopped and she was switched over to melatonin. Her blood pressure and diabetes medicines were adjusted um, to be in keeping with targets for older persons. And she ended up moving in with her son for about three weeks while she recovered from her delirium, which is something that we often will see is that um, it can take uh, several weeks, if not months, to recover from a delirium. Most people get close to where they were before, um, but some do not recover fully, which is what we have seen here with Mrs. Alcidi, that she's continued to have some decline in her short-term memory over time. And so six months later, her son does uh, make a, doc or a doctor appointment with her family physician, and then a referral is sent to their primary care memory clinic. So um, shifting topics a little bit, and I apologize for jumping around, but there was a number of topics that I was asked to, to cover over today. So going into driving and dementia. And, you know, if there's a couple things um, that I could leave you with, these would be a couple of points. One is that a diagnosis of dementia does not mean automatic retirement from driving. So many people with early stage dementia are able to continue driving safely with some accommodations. The other thing to remember is that performance on cognitive testing is generally not enough to predict someone's safety to drive. And so a multi-component assessment is recommended. So if it's not just the cognitive testing, what should families look for that would suggest that a person may no longer be safe to drive? So number one is getting lost when driving. Um, you know, we've all been turned around at one point or another in an unfamiliar circumstance, but most people can reason their way out of that. If they can't, uh, that is a concern. The next thing would be ability to remain in their lane or driving on the shoulder or over the center line. The next one is driving either too fast or too slow for the traffic. Um, becoming confused in intersections and not knowing which way to turn or is it their turn to go or is it someone else's turn to go or people making narrow or wide turns or turning into the wrong lane. If you'd like to know more information about this, again, I've put a link uh, at the bottom of the slide. Um, a question that I commonly get asked is, you know, 
how, how can you be worried about my loved one's driving ability, doctor? Uh, you know, they just passed their test with the Ministry of Transportation three months ago. And the thing to remember about that is the whole point of the Ministry of Transportation um, screening assessment for people over age 80 in Ontario is actually to enable drivers to keep driving. So yes, they do a vision screen and yes, they spend about five minutes doing a very short memory test, including drawing a clock and canceling out some letter H's. But the majority of the session is actually focused on how to drive safely. Um, and so the thing to remember is it's really not designed to take drivers off the road. It's supposed to be keeping them on the road safely. And so I guess it's perfectly possible that they, someone might pass that assessment and then their doctor might still have concerns. So in terms of what would be the recommended assessment for someone who's having difficulty or has possible difficulty with driving, or they just have a diagnosis of dementia and you wanna evaluate whether they are safe or are not safe to drive, this is sort of the multi-component assessment that a, a doctor, particularly a specialist would be doing. And so the first thing is looking at the symptoms that the person is having. And so if you are hallucinating or you are very agitated or uh, irritable, you're probably not uh, safe to be on the road. We also look at the person's functional ability. So if you've lost the ability to manage your medicines and manage your finances or, or manage your personal care, that's a very strong red flag that you probably also will have problems with driving. We look at the caregiver concerns. So a good question to ask is, would you be comfortable with this person driving your grandchildren or would you let your grandchildren cross the street in front of this person? If the answer is no, that's a concern. We'll look at their physical issues, so their neck mobility, what is their, their reaction time, is their thinking fast or is their thinking slow, are they drowsy or sleepy, do they have numbness or weakness in their arms or legs. We look at their vision, so you have to have um, a binocular vision, so that means both eyes of greater than 2050 to drive in Ontario. We'll also look at their visual fields, which is have they lost like half of the function of one eye or are they having double vision? Um, medicines can be a concern. So if a person is taking a medicine that is affecting their thinking or altering their level of consciousness, that's a red flag with regard to driving. We look at their visual spatial skills. So that might in or involve copying something or drawing something. And then we look at their processing speed, um, their mental flexibility skills. And so often that's through a, a connecting the dots type of task or a searching for different letters and numbers type of task. Um, reaction time is something we sometimes will evaluate. And then judgment is also an area that we'll look at. So, you know, if you're talking to the person about their safety to drive and they don't think that there would ever be a reason why they would have to retire from driving, that's a concern. It suggests that they really don't either have knowledge about their condition or awareness of their condition, because the reality is every person is going to have to retire from driving at some point when they have a diagnosis of dementia. So after we do that multi-component assessment, we sort of would sort people into buckets. So there's people that are clearly unsafe and they will be, um, uh, or the Ministry of Transportation, it's, it's the law that we would report that individual to the Ministry of Transportation. There's the people that are probably safe. And so they'll continue to drive and we would reevaluate every six to 12 months because we know at some point they will need to retire from driving. And we will start planning that at our first discussion. The last category is sort of that unclear category the middle category, the people that have issues in some areas, but not others. And for those individuals, either an assessment with a specialist or a functional driving test is what's recommended. And if you see a specialist and they're still not sure, they're going to recommend you have a functional driving test. I've put the link to a website where you can find all of the places that will do functional driving tests. 
what that means is you would, there's usually a two parts to that assessment. So there's a part where they'll look at your vision and they'll measure your reaction time with little computer tasks. Uh, and then it'll also involve an on-road driving test where you'll be with a driving instructor and an occupational therapist. What they hope to do is to demonstrate that you'll be safe to drive if you have particular accommodations. But if you're not safe to drive, they will tell you at that time and they'll send a report to your doctor. The concern that many people have with the functional driving test is the cost. And so the Ministry of Transportation will not cover that cost in Ontario. And so it can cost people between four and $800, uh, depending on which center you choose to go to. You can ask them their prices up front and you can shop around between the different centers for price. Um, but, but that for many people is a limiting factor with doing the functional driving assessment. So, you know, moving forward, if your loved one has been asked to stop driving, but it is continuously a topic that comes up, um, here's a, there's a couple of strategies on the next slides for some language that you can use. So you want to use very clear uh, statements that generally don't require the person to remember or to reason through the situation. So instead of saying, remember, the doctor told you can't drive, you got that letter from the Ministry of Transportation, you should say, I'll be the one to drive today, or it's my turn to drive today. So you've sort of taken that decision um, out of their mind. Another thing you can say is just sort of acknowledging their emotions. So instead of saying, don't be angry, you know, it's for your own safety that the doctor asked you not to drive. You should say something like, it's impossible not to be upset. I know that the driving was really important to you. I'm sorry that this has happened. Let's try to figure this out. Maybe I'll drive today. Another strategy that can be helpful is just sort of entering the world of the person that has the memory condition. So um, instead of saying, you know, remember you sold the car because you lost your license or I disabled the car battery because you lost your license, you can just simply say something like the car is being serviced, the car requires servicing. Um, if you're still having problems, you can talk to your doctor, they may have some suggestions. You can speak to your Alzheimer's Society counselor, they will often have great ideas. Um, removing the stressor is helpful and that relates to, you know, removing the keys from the rack just beside the door or taking away stimuli that remind that person of driving. Disabling the car is something that we do for in some situations or just simply moving the car to a different place. So a loved one's house or selling the car completely. Reminders are helpful for some. So maybe posting the notice of suspension, but for many people that just increases irritability and concern around the topic. So again, related back to our case, um, no one should be driving when they're delirious. And so I generally recommend that people not drive until they're reassessed by their doctor at some point after their delirium has recovered. Um, and again, with regard to the diagnosis of dementia, this patient may be safe to drive at first, but at some point she will need to retire and she will need to retire before there's an accident. We can't wait for something like that to happen. And so that's why we're doing all of these assessments in advance. So shifting focus to the last topic, um, this is a quote from Rosalind Carter. Uh, it says, there are four kinds of people in the world, those who currently are caregivers, those who have been caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who need caregivers. And I think that is it definitely holds true to um, certainly all of the people that I have seen. So um, going to our case again, um, the patient is now 81 years old and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease at the age of 77. Her daughter had taken over managing her finances three years ago and she retired from driving at that time. She's not been taking her medicines correctly in the blister package for over a year and she ultimately moved in with her son. 
Her son is feeling overwhelmed because she repeats the same question over and over again within minutes. She gets rank restless and anxious for periods through the day. She'll often pace. She's constantly moving things around and losing things and then accusing him of taking them. And maintaining her hygiene is a battle. She often will say that she's already taken a bath when she clearly requires a bath or some type of hygiene care. So this is what we would call responsive behaviors. And responsive behaviors refer to any action, word, or gesture that a person with dementia uh, uses as a way of responding to something negative, frustrating, or confusing within their environment. When we're treating responsive behaviors, we would always uh, go for a multi-component approach. So it's hard to treat um, responsive behaviors without sort of addressing all of these things together. Medicines is that part that the doctor can help with and medicines can be helpful, but they're only one part of the treatment. The other parts of treatment would include education and support for caregivers, which we'll talk a little bit about. And then the last component is respite and personal care support. So respite care refers to care that we would organize for that individual that gives their regular caregiver a break. So looking at medicines, what we tend to do is we tend to sort the symptoms into different categories and then we would choose a medicine to target a symptom within that category. So your doctor might be asking you about things like anxiety, aggression, irritability, psychotic symptoms like hallucinations, delusions, paranoias. Um, we'll be looking at mood, so thinking about depression, and often treating pain. If we look into that next category, which is education and support, support refers to giving the caregiver the support that they need to be able to keep give caregiving so that they don't burn out. And so supports that people might commonly use would be something like the Alzheimer's Society counselors. There is the Ontario Caregiver Association website and they also have a 24 seven hotline that you can call for support with your caregiving. I've put the number below. And then lastly, there's lots of other persons that we use for support, right? It can be friends, family members, it could be a social worker in some other context, it could be some other counselor, maybe your doctor, or in here on in Perth, there's also a research study going on called My Plan, which is actually one to one health coaching with a health coach on sort of taking care of yourself as a caregiver. The education component refers to learning the best approach for managing your loved one's particular responsive behavior. And I've listed again a number of places where you can look um, for supports on how to manage responsive behaviors. It could be a one on one with your counselor or a course through the Alzheimer's Society. It could be the website dementiacarers.ca. There's a great blog called Dementia Care Blazers. Um, iJerry Care is a webinar series that is helpful. Uh, Tipa Snow is an occupational therapist who does a lot of um, education with regard to managing dementia and responsive behaviors. Or the last one is there's the Regional Geriatric Program of Ontario uh, Caregiving Strategies, which is focused a little bit more on medical caregiving strategies. So how to deal with constipation, diarrhea, skin breakdown, bowel or bladder issues, for example. So just a quick um, slide here on the dementiacares.ca because it's the one, one that I use frequently. Um, they have online programs, in-person programs in non-COVID times. Um, a lot of videos, which are really good on managing particular aspects of responsive behaviors. There's some great handouts. They have a Facebook Live series. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention is their app. So this is a free app that you can download from the App Store on Google or iPhone. And it just is basically a guided discussion of how you might manage some of these different responsive behaviors. 
So it poses a very realistic scenario and gives you two or three options for how you might manage that. And then it works through, you know, what would happen if you managed it in this way versus what might happen if you managed it in a different way. And it's actually very, very well done. So check that out. Um, the, the book here on the left is one by the Alzheimer's Society on uh, managing uh, responsive behaviors and it's quite good. They have a, both a long and a short version and the links are uh, there below. And this Coping with Behavior Change in Dementia is a book for caregivers that I read when I was training and I found it quite helpful. And I will recommend it to families um, from time to time who are looking for you know, a short workbook style read. In terms of the respite care, um, this is an area that is very difficult uh, for caregivers to navigate. Um, and I'll show you some statistics on that in one slide. But there are resources that are available. I think it's just figuring out how to access them and then figuring out how to get your loved one to engage with that. So there is public pay respite through the Southwest Lynn Home and Community Care. People can hire someone privately to do respite, and there's resources for how to do that. You can use a friend or a family member. You can use recreation therapy or any of the recreation classes offered by the Alzheimer's Society. We have adult day programs that are managed by the Lynn, where a person can go for a half a day or a day or even overnight. We also have um, some overnight respite care options in at least in Huron and Perth. And I believe there's some coming in Gray and Bruce. And before COVID, what many people would do would be to book a regular respite stay in long-term care or in a retirement home where the person might go for a week um, and then come home after that to give their caregiver a bit of a break. And there's some information there on personal care services as well. So just kind of shining a spot on the um, just concerns or um, factors surrounding respite care. So 56% um, of Ontario caregivers who were surveyed in 2019 wanted care but couldn't afford it. And, you know, if that is you, I would encourage you to reach out to your local Alzheimer's Society counselor because there is ways of getting certain things subsidized if it's the day program or transportation or things like that. Um, other people avoided accessing care because they didn't think that their loved one would accept it or they were feeling guilty about sending them or they had lack of confidence in the care providers. And again, if that's you, then that Alzheimer's Society counselor can help you a lot with working through that. So there's ways of getting people to do things like day program, which is, you know, respective of their autonomy and, um, you know, allows a sm relatively smooth transition. So I, I hear that all the time. Um, so, so reach out if that is you. Um, a lot of people, so almost half say that they didn't know about supports that were available. Another chunk said there was not enough supports available, which is a, a big concern in our area, but something that I know a lot of us are working towards um, trying to figure out. And lastly, it was the concern that, you know, their healthcare provider just didn't really understand what it was that they needed. So if that is you, I would recommend that the first step is filling out something like a needs assessment. So I've put a link to the Ontario Caregiver Association caregiver task list. And that's where you would look at all of the activities that that person has to do and ask yourself, are you doing that or are they doing that or who's doing that and how you could get help with that and how often you would sort of need that help. Then we've got a research and discuss options. And so I've put a link to the Southwest Healthline, which is a website that covers Ontario. Southwest is our particular area, but no matter where your loved one lives in Ontario, there's a, there's a Healthline website for that region. It lists, if you go into the seniors tab, all the um, services that are available for older adults. Then in Ontario, the next step is putting your name on the wait list because pretty nearly everything that's funded by the government has a wait list. And so we encourage people to do that before it's a crisis so that by the time they're getting fatigued, that service can be put into place. The last step is implementing that plan and then revising it. So what we find is that sometimes our first kick at the can doesn't work, 
but we would go back, we'd reevaluate, and we would find a new respite plan that works for that individual. So we're, we're getting near the end. So thanks for bearing with me. The last point I've got here is self-care is not selfish. You cannot serve from an empty vessel. And I think all of the, call, uh, the counselors at the Alzheimer's Society would agree with this statement. So if we go back to our case uh, for one last time, uh, our patient was started on citalopram, which is an antidepressant, anti-anxiety medicine that she would take in the morning to sort of help overall with the mood. And then she was also given a short acting medicine to take around three o'clock in the afternoon, which was when her restlessness and anxiety and agitation would ramp up. Um, her son got education from the Alzheimer's Society. He also took a one-on-one, -on -one, or I, sorry, he also took a course with the Alzheimer's Society called You First, which is on managing some of these responsive behaviors. Um, Mrs. Alcide started the adult day program one day a week. Um, her husband, or sorry, her son was planning for her to go to respite care in long-term care once every two months. Uh, her daughter started coming one weekend a month to provide some care. They initially tried having a PSW from the Lynn coming in to help with bathing, but they just found that that routine um, did not work well for Mrs. Alcide. And so what we ended up doing was just giving the family the education around responsive behaviors that they needed to be able to do that successfully. She's now on the wait list for long-term care because the wait will be two to three years in the community that she lives in. And her family is planning to keep her at home as long as possible. So the take home points, I hope that you now have some understanding of what a geriatrician does and how they would fit into your care team. I hope that you can recognize delirium and dementia and know the difference and know what to do if your loved one is experiencing either of those conditions. I hope that you sort of understand how driving assessment is sort of a multifactorial uh, assessment and that we, when people have early dementia, we want to enable them to be able to drive, but at some point, everybody will have to retire from driving and it's important to start preparing for that. And lastly, just remembering that we often would take a multifactorial approach to treating responsive behaviors, which involves the medication, the education and support for caregivers, and then getting support with, for respite care and for personal care. So thank you very much to everyone for listening. Um, please put all of your questions in the chat. Uh, Jeanette and Sherry are